Uh, so I want to thank everyone for uh, having me here today. I really appreciate it. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about how we treat performance in the jQuery project. Um, I use this term holistic performance because um, honestly, like when it comes to performance on the client side, inside the browser, um, it's, it's incredibly complicated. There is no, there's typically no single good solution. There, a, a good solution comes from many different components. Um, so in, in this way, you really have to look at everything uh, together in order to get a good understanding of what performance means. Um, so when you analyze performance, um, you, you have to look at a number of different factors. The most common factor that people will typically look at for uh, uh, improving uh, JavaScript performance, for example, is you're looking at wall clock time. You want to see, you know, it, it, you stick it in Firebug or something, and you say, okay, you know, this ran in 50 milliseconds before, now it runs in 10 milliseconds. We have gotten faster. Um, however, that's only part of the story. You need to know if it's faster on all the browsers you need to support, and that's not always the case. Um, additionally, just because it's running faster. Uh, it, it, that may actually result in more CPU usage. So then you have a whole other series of issues uh, regarding that. Maybe uh, the, the fan kicks on on the, in the, in, uh, on the laptop that your person's using. Maybe it eats more battery life. There are a whole uh, series of issues with that. And of course, uh, now we start getting into memory consumption. If you have maybe a technique that you use for better performance uses more memory. Um, and of course, with memory usage comes memory leaks, and uh, browsers are just phenomenal at providing that for us. Um, and of course, you know, bandwidth consumption and its, its counterpart, uh, you know, the, the more you download, typically the longer it takes to parse. So you're gonna have all sorts of performance issues regarding that as well. Um, I know that the Google mobile team has been talking about that a lot lately, and they've been doing incredible hacks to try and avoid uh, uh, parse time. Um, and of course, what I mentioned before, you know, uh, uh, battery consumption. So um, it, it, again, to, go, to mention the, the Google Mobile, they, they uh, send down the entirety of all their scripts on page load, and they embed it in the page. And then, uh, but all the scripts are commented out, and they bring them out one by one, uncomment them, and execute them. That saves on parse time. They can do parse time dynamically, and it also saves on battery consumption because if the sensor are able to do the entire request in a single request, uh, instead of going back to the server for every single part of the file, because what happens is, is that every time you do a network request that uses a ton of battery on a mobile device, so you, they want to try and reduce battery usage. So again, this is all the total package of performance here on the client side, and these are all factors you kind of have to take in, into account. Um, so I wanted to use a little case study uh, that actually isn't jQuery related, but it's something that I was fiddling around with uh, recently. I was building a, a, a JavaScript uh, uh, based a dictionary lookup uh, mechanism. And typically when people are, are building some sort of dictionary lookup, and, and this is dictionary in the traditional sense, you know, you have you know, uh, tens of thousands of words, you need to see if a certain word is in this dictionary. Um, typically people are most worried about the performance of of lookups, and they're also concerned about the performance of, or performance of file size. They want to make sure the dictionary is as small as possible. So it was interesting, because I was uh, uh, looking around at d various solutions, and almost all the solutions I found optimized for uh, the download size. They tried to ship a dictionary in the fewest number of bytes possible. So obviously, that is one valid metric of performance. You know, they, they wanted to make sure that that one metric was met and, um, uh, and disregarding everything else. So obviously there's a very naive solution uh, uh, that, that doesn't optimize for file size, and, and that is just to send down literally a flat file with all the words in it. That's gonna consume, obviously, a, a, you know, a ton of file size, uh, but lookups could be very fast, since you can just stick it all in, a, in a, an object and look up key value pairs. But one solution uh, that's very popular that optimizes for file size is using a, a tree. And what you can do here is you can merge a whole bunch of words into a very compact data structure. So this, uh, if you put uh, all the entire dictionary in a tree, you can reduce the file size dramatically uh, compared to just a, a normal list of words. 
so I thought this was very interesting. So I started to do a whole lot of analysis. I looked at the simple solutions. I looked at trees. I looked at vari variations of optimized trees. And what's interesting here is, so I have a little chart showing the file size of these various dictionaries. And I looked at the file size both in, norm in a normal state and in a gzip uh, state. Because there's no way I'm going to send down a, a dictionary in a non-gzip state. Um, so what's interesting here is that Obviously, a plain string dictionary is, you know, is, is like 275K. That's uh, a lot. I don't want to send down that much. Um, but like, you, if you see, you, when you start sending down the different size trees, uh, you can save a lot of file size. You can get it down to about 100K, uh, give or take. And, that, and so th that's already you know, you know, cutting your, your, your bandwidth in half there. And the users will be able to start using it that much faster. But notice the second part here. So, so obviously we want to send down less over the pipe. We, we, we don't want to send down you know, you know, uh, 275K downloads. But look at the uncompressed size. Now this is important because this starts to give us an indicator of how much memory is going to be used by these various dictionaries. Um, it, it, at least it, it's an indicator, it's not necessarily the, the actual memory usage. Um, so I'll get to that in a second. So and I also looked at how quickly uh, you can load the dictionary. And when I say load, I mean you receive the data from the server and you turn it into a dictionary that you can use. Um, what's interesting here is that it's actually really, really expensive to build that tree. Uh, you know, so it's a good data structure. It, it compresses it very nicely, but it's actually really expensive. Uh, it, with that initial parse time on a really fast computer is 112 milliseconds. If you put that on even on any mobile device, you know, iPhone, an Android device, whatever, that's going to be multiple seconds and it'll just freeze the browser. It is not a, you know, a workable solution. Um, and of course, then there's the performance of looking up uh, items as well. But what, this is where it starts to get really interesting, though, is that when you start looking at memory usage. So I looked at uh, again, the, the various solutions that were out there, and I, when looking at trees, it, was, it became apparent that a lot of them did not optimize for memory usage at all. They would create tons and tons of objects, they would use all sorts of prototypal inheritance, they would just be incredibly expensive. And so you can see here that uh, each tree uh, used about 2.75 uh, megs of memory. Um, and uh, that's, if, and especially on like a mobile device, that can be a lot. And of course, like a normal hash was monstrous. It was 10 megs. It's not even a, a worthy solution. So the, there were a number of solutions. Uh, so obviously, uh, a normal tree would not work. And what ended up happening is that because of, uh, the, of the analysis that was done here, I was able to take a step back and look at different solutions for optimizing a tree. And so eventually, one solution was arrived upon uh, uh, it, where it's called a succinct tree. And it was actually sent down in a binary state that was, it didn't need to be turned into a JavaScript object before being used. And because of that, it could, you could operate it simply as a string. So it used very little memory, it had very fast lookups, and its file size was small. So I just thought that was particularly interesting because using this analysis, using a holistic analysis uh, of not just looking at file size or, or bandwidth in this case, we were, uh, were able to find a solution that was even better, a solution that was not only faster, but used less memory as well. Uh, one tool I just want to mention offhand, I know there's a, a talk on it later, is, is Dynatrace. Uh, I've been using this personally um, for a lot of analysis. It, it's used, it, it exists both, both for Internet Explorer and Firefox, and it's a way to really tap into your system uh, and understand some of the underlying uh, operations that are going on. So you can see things like CPU usage over time. You can see exactly how long different methods are taking uh, uh, internally in a browser. Uh, I, I've used this uh, a number of times. So at least in the jQuery project, uh, uh, we, we look at performance in a, in a very particular way. We need to think about the larger context that exists. Because at this point, jQuery is running, and Steve, you can correct me, I, but I think it's on 44% of all websites are using jQuery. Uh, so that's a lot of websites, and it's a ton of users that are using it every single day. And so we need to make sure that jQuery is running 
in the best possible way. And we can't be ignoring uh, uh, specific browsers, uh, for example. Um, we also need to make sure that we don't sort of pre-optimize the code. We, we need to make sure that when we are doing our performance analysis and our performance optimization, that what we're changing is actually going to affect real users. Um, so we need to go out there and find and see what people are actually doing and make sure the changes that we make are going to benefit them. Um, additionally, we don't want to compromise uh, our, our code quality just by landing a performance change. And we need to make sure that the changes that we're landing are actually important. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we want to make sure that the cross-browser compatibility is there. We aren't going to drop support for a browser for simply for a, uh, getting per better performance than another. So when it comes down to it, in the jQuery project, we have a few rules that we follow. The first one, if you want to make a performance change in jQuery, you have to prove that it's going to affect us in a positive way. Um, so the, the way we do this is, so I mean, we, we do this inherently. A anytime uh, um, anyone, so actually we do this across the project. Anytime anyone submits a bug report, uh, we demand proof that it's a bug. We, we demand a, a working reproducible test case. Um, we use a JS fiddle uh, for that. It's a nice little thing. You can paste in HTML and CSS, and you get a, a nice little view. Uh, there's a very similar tool for performance called JSPerf. JSPerf is very cool. You can paste in a little bit of a, uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you can build performance test cases that are reproducible and uh, collect the results. We love JSPerf. We use it everywhere. Um, so in this case, so whenever anyone proposes a performance change, we ask them to create a JSPerf test case. So it, what's, what's nice about JSPerf is quite a few things, is that it's not only is it easy to create these reproducible tests that you can distribute, uh, but it's also really easy to fork existing tests. So if you see someone who's made an existing test, but they messed it up somehow, you can go in and change it and create your own. So it's really nice in that way. Uh, because uh, oftentimes, it, you know, people don't create perfect tests. It, it's an iterative thing. So here's an example of a, a JSPerf view, so to speak. It, this is just the, the overview. This is one of the tests that we had for uh, jQuery 1.6. We were uh, adjusting the performance of retrieving a value from a form element. And uh, so there's a little bit of uh, a JavaScript that initializes. And this is what it looks like when you're running the tests. Uh, so you have specific tests with, with blocks of code, and you, it instantly shows you what items are running faster, how much faster, and, and what ones are slower. You know, so it gives you all sorts of a metric, a metric breakdown there. Um, but what's really nice is that it's doing the performance analysis in a way that is really, really good and statistically sound. You would not believe the number of uh, performance analysis tools, at least within JavaScript, that are incredibly bad, that do not do good analysis, uh, and, and even some of the major uh, um, uh, browser testing frameworks that exist, like SunSpider, uh, you know, they, they, they're just not doing it in, in, in a proper way. Um, so what JSPerf is actually doing is, is a really nice technique, which is they try to run as many tests as they possibly can within a given time frame. Typically, that's, uh, that's about five seconds. So what they try to do is, is they actually test the code ahead of time to see how fast it's going to run in general. And then based upon that, they actually sculpt the test suite so that it runs as fast and as optimally as possible. So what, what this means is that they actually do things to make sure that there, there's less overhead in the test suite itself. So that if, you, if you're measuring something that's running incredibly fast, you know, like one millisecond or fractions of a millisecond, you can actually get really good and reliable numbers uh, from JSPerf. Um, they also use a, a Java applet for doing, um, getting really high performance uh, timer information as well. So this, is, uh, this goes way beyond you know, the millisecond boundary. Um, so the second, second rule that we have in, uh, in jQuery is that you, when you're doing a performance change, you have to see the big picture. Um, more importantly, uh, uh, we generally frown upon micro-optimizations. 
So these are changes that people are making uh, 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 to typically to just pure JavaScript, uh, attempting to make things faster. So <laughs> I mean, what I say here, it, it doesn't matter how many times you unroll a loop, if that loop is looping over DOM manipulation. Like DOM manipulation is many, many factors slower than anything JavaScript will ever do. So, like, so it doesn't matter how much you optimize performance of JavaScript if you're still doing DOM stuff. And this has actually been one of my biggest gripes against much of the performance analysis that goes on for browsers. When you look at the, the performance of browsers, they typically only analyze JavaScript performance, and they completely ignore all the DOM, uh, 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 all the DOM manipulation, all the CSS rendering, all the reflows, all the painting, and like all that is so critically important to understanding performance in a browser. But that's a whole other topic. Um, so at least in most applications, it's pretty safe to say that JavaScript itself is not the performance bottleneck. And in fact, it's almost always DOM performance. So again, uh, when we, we, we request that anyone who's pr uh, proposing a performance change prove that what they're doing is actually going to benefit uh, uh, everyone. And, and again, so the, this is, we want to see cases um, uh, from, you know, from the real world. So rule number three, we want clean code. So, J, so jQuery, obviously, it's, it's used by you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, and it's also, con, you know, we have people contributing to it every single day. We need to make sure that we keep clean, well-documented code so that people can continue, can, can continue to contribute to the code and understand what's going on. Uh, so in this way, we will not compromise our code quality for performance. It, it, this is a hard line that we draw. So there are also, but again, uh, the sort of the nice side effect of this is that typically the only times in which you compromise code quality are for the silly micro optimizations that really don't get you much of anything anyway. So, so for example, I, I kind of list a couple micro optimizations here that are, uh, in, in my opinion, not so good. Um, and, and so there are different ways of doing the same operation in JavaScript. So for example, doing this crazy uh, 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 multiplication uh, uh, instead of doing parse in, or, or, or doing a, a string coercion with a new date to get the, uh, the, get the time stamp, as opposed to just calling get time on a date. Uh, it, it's stuff like that. It, it makes it much harder to maintain when you don't, um, when you write unclear code. Um, and again, don't even get me started on loop unrolling. I, I, I don't, like we, we get patches to this, to jQuery all the time. People submitting a, a pull request and they'll be like, oh, I unrolled some, I unrolled some loops and it, it, it's like 0.005% faster and it's just, ah. Oh. Anyway, okay. Um, rule number four, don't slow down Internet Explorer. And I, I say Internet Explorer specifically simply because it is, far and away the slowest browser. I mean, uh, at least you know, nine is great stuff, but we, we're still haunted by the, the, the lingering ghost of six, seven, and eight, and they will be around forever. So at least right now, we need to make sure that the changes that we do don't cripple performance for IE six, seven, or eight. And oftentimes, we'll, we'll, we'll optimize for IE six first, and then go through and look at the ramifications in other browsers. And this actually tends to work pretty well because since IE6 tends to choke on the most basic of things, uh, any sort of optimi optimization you do there will have that much of a greater effect in other browsers. So, I mean, it works out well in the end. Um, so, uh, additionally, you shouldn't, tr you shouldn't compromise your performance uh, um, you shouldn't compromise performance in one browser to benefit another. You should try to make sure that you're, you're kind of you know, lifting all boats equally. In the end, uh, you really want to communicate these results. So, so again, if you're following these rules and, and you're doing uh, actual performance improvements, you want to make sure you, you communicate the results of these performance improvements in an effective way. But to do that, you have to start by creating realistic tests. Now, I, 
I, I wish we could go into this more, but, it, it's, it, but it's hard because it is such a hard problem. It's incredibly hard creating a good, realistic test case to analyze performance. Um, one of the techniques that we do in the jQuery project, and, and it helps us because uh, since so many people use it, we can go and use things like Google code search and we can find all the cases where people have, are using jQuery in a particular way, and we can analyze that and optimize our engine so that it runs faster for the ways in which people are already using the library. Uh, so th this is kind of nice. It, it, it can be a very uh, uh, iterative process. Um, but, uh, but we can also use this, again, using Google Code Search or similar, to build test cases out. Um, and that works out uh, uh, rather well. And then finally, th th when you're communicating the result, so we, uh, we use a, a browser scope, and, and I, as I mentioned browser scope specifically because browser scope is tied into JSPerf. Now this is what makes, one of the things that makes JSPerf so awesome, is that you build your test cases, and then you pass it out to people. So what we typically do in, in jQuery is that we'll uh, 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 collect, you know, we'll have we'll someone to say, okay, I have a performance improvement, here's my pull request, here's my test case. And then they'll take, we'll take that test case and send it out to dozens of people, or, or, or you know, uh, put it on IRC or on Twitter, uh, get people using this test case. And what's nice is that JSPerf dumps all the results straight back into browser scope. And, and, and what browser scope is, is it's a way for collecting performance results and, and allows you to compare it from browser to browser. So what's great is that all we have to do is pass around this URL and we instantly have aggregated hundreds of results of performance data across dozens of browsers that we can instantly analyze and, and, and understand. And this is, this is especially good because it allows us to broaden our horizons. We're not just looking at Firefox or Chrome. We're looking at you know, a dozen browsers, including mobile platforms, and making sure that the performance is good across all of these cases. You know, it would be really bad if we were landing a, a, a change that, for example, like crippled performance on mobile devices. So it, it's, it's really important for us to understand the ramifications uh, across there. So, uh, and then finally, when you're, uh, uh, you know, creating the results, uh, you, it's, we find it best. And so, I mean, we've been creating, you know, doing performance changes now for uh, uh, over five years. And what we found to work, to work best is when you're comparing yourself to your past self, it, it essentially treat, treating yourself as your worst enemy. You know, you, you're constantly trying to improve, constantly trying to improve your performance and, and provide those results to your users. So for example here, this is a, a performance test that we ran, uh, I think for jQuery 1.6. Again, this is for uh, getting the, the, the value of, of an element. And so here we, we analyze across uh, uh, seven different platforms, and you can see the performance uh, and how it changes in between the old version, the old version's in blue, the new version's in green. But what's nice is being able to see this in aggregate is that you can instantly see how much of a performance improvement there was. Uh, uh, you can see it, and, and on a browser-by-browser browser basis. Um, so we try to provide results like this on a pretty uh, consistent basis. Uh, obviously, th you might be inclined, and I, I, we used to be this way, we, we were inclined to show our results relatively to other platforms, other frameworks. Uh, we don't do this anymore, um, some, mostly because it, it tends to create way more drama than it's worth. Um, but it, 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 in, in the nearer sense, uh, um, we are our best competition. Because uh, the, the thing is, is that when these, uh, 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 competitions are created, they aren't always identical. So, uh, so in this way, like for example, jQuery is a fundamentally very different library than most other JavaScript libraries. And comparing them apples to apples usually doesn't make much sense. So at least for, at least for jQuery, we try to, again, just compare against ourselves and make sure that we're constantly pushing, constantly improving. And, we, and, and to do that, we embrace people in the community who are really concerned about performance. You know, we make sure that their voices are heard. 
we, we provide them with tools like JSPerf to make sure that they're able to prove that you know, what they're doing is, is, or what we're doing is not good. And at the same time, we embrace you know, the code that they contribute. We make sure that what they're doing is good and we get it landed. So in, in this way, in every single release, we're pushing out better and better code. So yeah, um, uh, just uh, some more information. I definitely recommend checking out JSPerf and Dynatrace. They're fantastic tools. And I, I've, I've also written uh, extensively on my blog about uh, uh, performance analysis and especially uh, testing frameworks and how they analyze performance, usually incorrectly. Um, yeah, that's it, but so thank you.